Well, hello and good evening, OCPS families. We are so excited that you are joining us this evening for another one of our virtual mini academies. This evening, we are joined by Ms. Taranisha Young, who is the Senior Administrator of ESE Parent Outreach and Instructional Support and Mild to Moderate Disabilities. And she's going to be sharing with you the ESE and Section 50 plan, 504 plan allowable testing accommodations. And we all know that as parents, we always wanna make sure that our children are getting all of the accommodations, the benefits they deserve, and so she's going to share that with us tonight. So welcome, Taranisha. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you so much for that phenomenal introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, again, tonight, I'm going to present on ESC and Section 504 Plan Allowable Testing Accommodations. As she previously mentioned, my name is Taranisha Young, and I'm a senior administrator in our ESC department. Um, I currently support all parent outreach um, as well as our workshops. And this year I've gained another title where I'm also supporting um, instructors for our students with mild to moderate disabilities. Um, just a quick kind of um, FYI, again, I do work for the um, ESC department and our testing department. So there may be questions that are extremely specific to testing that I may have to take back to our testing department, but we will have an avenue for you to um, submit those questions if it is something that is very technical that I would need their support on. Outside of that, we will go through how to locate your students' testing accommodations and identify some of those allowable ones for upcoming um, assessments. So in order for us to get the most out of our time together, we have a few expectations and commitments that we'll be utilizing. Um, we're gonna take a moment to briefly review them. Um, again, the information is on the slide. I will not read those to you, but I just wanted to share um, some of the major ones. Um, again, we'd like you to participate in any of the discussion um, questions that come up throughout the presentation. Um, if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat um, and Toria will be here assisting, just kind of shouting out those questions as they come up. Um, we want you to really be present, choose your attitude. Um, we want you to play, ask questions if you um, become curious at any point um, about specific things related to testing. And again, I'm going to commit myself to making your day, sharing information with you that you may not already know about testing and the accommodations um, for your students. So as we work through the presentation, again, I want you to feel free to ask questions, but ensure that those questions are good for the group. If you have very student specific questions, um, as you know, in special education, all of our students are unique and have unique accommodations at times. Um, you can use the QR code that is on your screen or the link that is there. Um, we are also going to place that link in the chat for you. That would be a good spot for very student specific questions. Um, this platform would not necessarily be the best place. It is recorded. So again, things that are very unique to your student, you'll want to use the parent support ticket to ask those questions. And then someone from our parent outreach team will reach out to you as soon as possible with those student specific questions. But again, but again if you have questions that are good for the group, feel free to ask those um, in the chat. All right, so let's take a moment to build community before we begin working through the content of this presentation. I want you to take a moment to review the self-care board. I'll give you a couple moments just to review the different um, self-care components in each of those blocks. As you're reading, think about which of those options that are provided do you need most to recharge? And then we want you to place your answer in the chat. I see some already coming in. We have sleep, connecting with my support system, time to yourself, tea, books and writing, 
resting in yoga, time being creative, walking, time to myself. Again, resting and catching up on sleep. So as you can see with these, we all require very different things. I saw some that I definitely resonated with sleep. Um, again, getting out and walking when I'm able to, but we all require very different things to recharge. Our students also have very different needs. One way that we ensure that we're meeting the needs of all learners while testing is by implementing accommodations. We're gonna further discuss testing accommodations throughout this presentation. Let's go ahead and get started. During this session, we will present on the following. How to determine which testing accommodations your child currently has. Who to contact if you have specific questions about your child's testing accommodations. And common testing accommodations that you'll find many students throughout our district as well as other districts have. The next section will provide you with guidance on how to determine what testing accommodations your, your child should be receiving and which assessments they will take. If you have your child's IEP handy, this, this portion of the presentation um, might be helpful to kind of take a look at that. If not, you can kind of jot down notes or this recording will be available for you to kind of come back to later so that you're able to go in and identify those accommodations if you're not already aware um, of what they are. So it's important to understand that testing accommodations are provided based on student documented needs. This means that the student must have data to support the need for the accommodation to be added to the student's IEP or 504 plan. Assessment accommodations can be provided in four areas. Presentation, which is how students receive the information on an assessment. Responding, basically how the students show what they know. Setting, how the environment is made accessible for instruction and assessment, and scheduling, how time demands and schedules may be adjusted. So in just a few moments, we're gonna talk specifically to what types of accommodations fall into each of those categories. And again, as we go through and you're exposed to or you hear other accommodations that your student may or may not have, just always keep in mind that in order for students to receive specific accommodations, there has to be a demonstrated need that is also backed up by data. So it's not a menu where we're able to just go in and pick and say, I think I like this one, this one would be great. Um, this works for me, so it probably works for my child. That's not really the way it goes. So you may hear things throughout this presentation that your student has or may not have on their IEP, but just know that those decisions are all database decisions that are team-based um, and occur during your IEP meetings. So the following questions guide IEP teams when determining a student's accommodation needs. What instructional and assessment tasks are difficult for the student to do independently? Are these difficulties documented in the present level statement? So that's another part of your child's IEP where it discusses the strengths as well as the areas where they still need additional support. So for this particular question, we're looking at the areas where students may have difficulty completing things that are required for them independently. Why are these tasks difficult for the student? What accommodations will allow the student to access the information and demonstrate performance of this task? And how will the IEP team know if the accommodation is effective? So these are all things that we look at when determining um, accommodations that are most appropriate for our student, not just for testing, but even in the classroom. So which assessments will my child take? So before we start talking specifically about the accommodations that are allowable on the different assessments, we're gonna look at how you're able to identify which assessments your child will take. This section of the IEP will provide you with the team decision regarding your child's participation on the alternate assessment, statewide standard assessments, and district-wide assessments. So within your child's IEP, I actually pulled this one from um, 
kind of a mock IEP. So yours should look identical if you find this section where um, it is discussing assessments. Um, it's important to know which assessments your child will take each year as different tests may be administered using different formats, such as computer-based versus paper-based. The test format will oftentimes impact the allowable accommodations or how accommodations may be implemented. Students with 504 plans take all state and district-wide assessments. The option of an alternative, alternative assessment is only an option for students that receive specialized instruction on access points, and that would be our alternate assessment. So again, within this portion of your child's IEP, if you take a look there, you will be able to determine which district-wide assessments your child takes each year, um, any state or standardized assessments, and you will also be able to determine in the very first line if your student is considered eligible for the alternate assessment. So again, if you don't have your student's IEP in front of you, that is okay. Um, you can just jot down that it would be under the category that specifies assessments. And again, this is something that you should go over within your IEP meeting, but it never hurts to go back and kind of take a look because again, as the school years and the grade levels change, oftentimes so do the assessments. My student was in second grade last year and he took one assessment and now he's in third grade. So he's looking at taking the FAST assessment as opposed to the STAR. So again, just taking a look at that each year because those assessments do change at times with the grades. Assessment accommodations are provided during statewide or district-wide assessments. Classroom-based assessments, students are also provided those same accommodations. They may be used only if they do not alter the underlying content that is being measured by the assessment or negatively affect the assessment's reliability or validity. There are limitations on some allowable accommodations. So for example, oral presentation is allowable on some parts of some tests, but not on all. And when I say oral presentation, that's where a student is able to be read to. So if the assessment is assessing or trying to determine a student's proficiency in reading, it would make sense that oral presentation would not be allowed for components of the assessment where the student is demonstrating that they are able to actually read the content. Refer to the applicable administration manual for test specific information regarding allowable accommodations. I'm gonna share with you how to access those manuals a little bit further in the presentation, but those manuals will specify the things that can be read to students versus not if they have the oral presentation accommodation. Accommodations used on statewide and district wide assessments must be based on student need and be the same or nearly the same as those needed and used by the student in completing classroom instruction and assessment activities. A parent must provide signed content, consent for classroom instructional accommodations that would not be available or permitted on statewide or standardized assessments. There are very few accommodations that fall into this category. So basically what that means is there are a few accommodations that students are able to use in their classroom or during you know, everyday instructional tasks or activities that are not allowable in assessments. If your child has an accommodation that will fall into that category, you are required to sign that you understand that so that when assessments come, you're not blindsided with the idea that my student had this accommodation for you know, everyday instruction, but they're not allowed to have this for a standardized or district-wide assessment. So again, very, very few students are in this predicament and very few accommodations fall into this category. Section 504 plans also explicitly list the assessment accommodations that a student is eligible to receive. So again, if you look at the screen right up under assessment accommodations, it will list out specifically what the student is able to have Due to the brevity of the document in comparison to an IEP, they are much easier to find. When listed, these accommodations are considered necessary to measure the student's academic and functional performance on statewide and district-wide assessments. So just like we were discussing with um, the IEP and assessment accommodations, these are based on student needs. And again, as a team, these are developed and determined um, based on the student's needs in those meetings.
So unique and non-allowable accommodations. Each assessment handbook will outline the allowable assessment accommodations. Most classroom instruction accommodations are also allowable on district and state assessments. In the event your child has an accommodation in the classroom that is not allowed, again, as I shared on the last screen, you will be provided with the opportunity to consent to the imp implementation of the non-allowable accommodation in the classroom. Unique accommodations are specialized accommodations that require alterations to the existing test materials, presentation, or administration guidelines. So basically anything that does not follow the standardized protocol of the assessment. I'll give you an example. I had a student many years back um, that had some residual um, vision, but he needed things to be much, much larger than those of his other peers. So we did have to, have to put in a special request with the state to have a fairly large printed assessment. So he still got the same paper-based assessment, but it was much, much larger in size. And so that was a unique accommodation that we had to apply for and request from the state um, that would not have been provided with us doing those um, additional steps. Again, requests may be submitted for such accommodations that are outside of the scope of currently available um, test materials and or established test administration procedures. In order to be approved for, you, for use during the test, a unique accommodation must be documented on an IEP or Section 504 plan, must be used regularly by the student during classroom instruction and for assessments, and must not negate the validity or threaten the security of the assessment. Each unique accommodation must be approved by the Commissioner of Education or a designee prior to its use. So again, even with the student that I previously worked with, it was something that had to be approved far beyond our district in order for us to provide that accommodation. And that student also had to be provided materials during typical um, instructional activities so that we were able to say that that's an accommodation that he receives routinely and it would not become a hindrance or a barrier to the test taking if we were all of a sudden to spring that on him for testing. Okay, and so I've mentioned multiple times the um, assessment manuals that are available to you. And so on your screen, you actually have two QR codes. Those QR codes are going to take you to the Florida Assessment Portal and they are also going, the other one is going to take you to the accommodations guide. So much of the information that I'm sharing with you this evening comes directly from those guides. Um, but again, they're pages and pages long, so they're much more detailed than what I'm providing. Again, you're able to find your student specific grade level, specific assessment, and then you're able to um, kind of really hone in on just the details of those assessments. So re recently, there have been a lot of changes to the required assessments for students in Florida. Again, students just kind of got out of a testing window of the, the FAST and the STAR assessment. Many of these changes are grade and content specific. As your student progresses through the grade levels, it's important that you are aware again of which assessments they're required to take and the allowable accommodations associated with that assessment. For example, in elementary schools, only fifth grade students take the statewide science assessment. This will be a new assessment for students that are new to fifth grade. So if your student were in fourth grade last year going to fifth grade, you may not be aware that they're now taking a science assessment that they didn't have to previously take. So for that a science assessment, there are specific accommodations um, that align to that test that may be different for another assessment if let's say it were computer based. Determining if assessments will be paper-based or computer-based and which accommodations your child will receive on each are all questions that you will want answers to early in the school year, because again, that will determine what those accommodations look like. As shared on the previous slides, this information can typically be found in your child's IEP and should be discussed at their annual review meeting. So if that has not occurred um, as of yet for this school year, it is the start of the school year and you want to know early on, feel free to set up a meeting with your school-based staffing specialist um, in conjunction with your testing coordinator, because again, they're gonna have much more specific information regarding um, the assessments that your student will take, what those accommodations will look like um, on their campus. 
The testing coordinator, school staffing specialist, and your child's teacher are great supports for your questions in these areas. The start of the school year, which is now, is a great time to go back and refer to your child's IEP, and that way you're able to ask any questions that you have. If your student um, had their annual review at some point last year, especially closer to the end of the year, a lot of times they go ahead and put in those assessments for the upcoming school year. Um, so you can begin asking those questions as early as you feel um, are necessary in the subsequent school year. The QR codes again on the screen will take you to the most current statewide assessment accommodations guide. Please make sure when you're out kind of searching for those guides or filtering through, they do change every single school year. So just pay close attention to the years that are on the front of those guides. Um, because again, they create new ones based on the testing changes each year and you don't wanna be looking at old information because as I mentioned, there have been quite a few changes. These resources will provide you with the most current information about testing accommodations, assessment guidelines. They also provide sample questions, um, scoring guidelines and other key information regarding any of the assessments that our students would be required to take at each of the grade levels um, here in the state of Florida. So this is what those assessment accommodation um, manuals will look like. Um, again, there are two separate ones because we have the K through two progress monitoring statewide assessments. And then we have all of the other assessments. There are quite a few um, that are in this, just the general statewide assessment guide because that carries us from grades three through 10. Um, it also covers EOCs, um, prior FSA retakes, the Florida Civics Literacy Exam. Um, so quite a few assessments in um, the guide that covers grades three through um, 10. And then again, you have the K through two progress monitoring. Okay, and so what you have on your screen now is the allowable accommodations for STAR. And so this is the assessment, the progress monitoring assessment for students in kindergarten through second grade, unless they are taking um, much later, the alternate assessment. So that would not even be a factor in some of the younger grades. Students in K2, again, take the STAR assessment in both reading and math, this statewide progress monitoring assessment is computer-based. So again, that matters because if you have a student that has accommodations that are specific to paper-based testing, then that would not be something that's even applicable for a computer-based assessment. However, on the flip of that, if you have a student that let's say has oral presentation, you might notice that one of the accommodations is text-to-speech. So for the STAR um, assessments, they do have components that for any student, they're read to. But let's say your student's IEP says must be a human reader. We would then need for you to understand as well as the school and they have all of this information where they will not have the student necessarily use those components where it's text to speech, but they will actually have someone sit with the student to read those same components. And again, those are determined based on student need, and it would be something listed in their IEP if they had to have a human reader as opposed to the text-to-speech function. Again, this is just a list of, the, of a common allowable accommodations for this assessment. And this is a screen, um, a table that I actually found in the actual manual. So again, it's very specific. Um, again, if you have questions about any of the assessments, I probably found more information than I even needed going through each of them, but there's tons there. And again, if you find that there are things that you don't quite understand just reading from the manual, you are always welcome to set up meetings with, again, the school staffing specialist, your child's teacher, as well as the testing coordinator. And so with this next screen, I don't have a similar table um, for our higher grades, just because they take so many different assessments and all of the assessments are so different. Um, but this does give you an idea of the different content areas that will be assessed for third through 12th grade. So again, this chart on your screen highlights the current required assessments for students on general education standards in the state of Florida. 
The previously referenced accommodations manual, again, will highlight all of the allowable and unique accommodations associated with each assessment. Again, if I went through each of these assessments and each of the separate allowable accommodations, we'd be here until the weekend, which none of us want. But I did want to give just a general guideline based on kind of grade level, which assessments are typically assessed unless a student's on an alternative assessment. And that way, once you access the manual, you have an idea based on the content areas here, as well as what's in your student's IEP. And again, these are just the state um, wide assessments. We do have some other things such as PMAs and things like that within the district that students also take. And so your testing coordinator at your child's school, as well as those sections in your IEP can facilitate you in determining what test um, your student will be taking. Anisha, um, yes. only because you brought up the PM one, the PMAs, mm -hmm. we did have a question in the chat and I was going to save it, but, but we're talking about this okay. and a parent was asking that, uh, if a child is allowed accommodations on the fast. I guess they've experienced where for PM1 and PM2, the child has not been given those accommodations, but has gotten it for PM3. Is there a reason why the, accom the accommodations would be uh, in place for PM3, but then they wouldn't use them for PM1 or 2? That should not be the case unless that student was, you know, given those accommodations at a meeting that occurred after PMA one or two. That would be the only reason that I could see that that happening. We have had students that were staffed after their meetings where their accommodations changed based on needs after they had taken a prior assessment. But they should be receiving their accommodations on any district wide assessment um, as well as classroom assessments. So even beyond PMAs, their classroom assessments. Um, they should be receiving those accommodations um, at all times. So if your student has had situations where they were not provided those accommodations, I would definitely um, suggest reaching out to the school-based staffing specialist and testing coordinator um, to ensure that those things are taking place um, because they should have them on any assessment. I thought so too, and I just wanted to make sure we clarified. And then there was another quick question that said, AP tests are not statewide tests. So if a student has accommodations, are they allowed to have those accommodations during the AP tests? As long as they're allowable accommodations for the AP assessments. Now, this is where, again, you really want to make connection with your school based testing um, coordinator, staffing specialist, and even guidance counselor, because different schools have different contacts that take care of this. There is a process. Um, for like some of the AP exams and even some of like the SAT exams and things like that, where they actually have to apply in advance and there are deadlines for those accommodations. So those work kind of independently of the schools, um, but there are school-based contacts that could assist in applying for those accommodations. So yes, they can still have those accommodations as long as they're allowable assessment accommodations and many of them are there is just a separate application piece because a lot of those are aligned to like college entrance and college credits. And so that's not necessarily district um, guided assessments. Right, so it wouldn't just be automatic. You would have to be very purposeful in applying Absolutely. for that, for those accommodations. Well, that was really yes. helpful. Um, oh, and someone was asking PM, what does that acronym mean? No, it's okay. It means progress monitoring. Yes. So when we do the FAST assessment, that FAST assessment is given three times a year. PM1 would be at the beginning of the year. It's your progress monitoring one. And then PM2 is given in the middle of the year. That's progress monitoring two. And even though we say PM3, that's given at the end of the year, and it's actually, when we say progress monitoring three, it really is the summative mm -hmm. assessment um, for the year. So, good questions. Everyone's Absolutely, really those involved. are fantastic questions. Thank you for asking those, because I'm sure we had others that um, might have had those same questions. So, similar to the table that I gave before, again, it's not as detailed because there are so many other assessments that, you know, we have to look at when we're looking at the other grade levels. But this table lists available accommodations for each of the assessments for grades 3 through 12. 
These are available accommodations that are built into the assessments or the assessment protocol. So in addition to these accommodations, many students receive other common testing accommodations. So some of these are more so what's built into the protocol or actual system, but there are other common testing accommodations that many students receive on these assessments. And again, I could not list, possibly list them all, but again, that manual and your child's IEP will help um, for you to see specifically um, for your student, which accommodations um, they are able to have on each of the assessments that they must take individually. So other common allowable testing accommodations. And so again, I mentioned at the start of this that I'd get into just some of the frequently seen or implemented accommodations. Um, I taught special education for quite some time. And again, I still work within that department. And so these are some of the more common accommodations that you see within the testing groups um, on our campuses. It's not to say that this is an exhaustive list. There are tons of accommodations out there and any that are listed on your child's IEP will be honored as long as they are allowable testing accommodations, but these tend to be some of the most um, common ones that we see. So determination of appropriate accommodations and assessment situations for students with disabilities, again, is based on their individual needs. Decisions on these accommodations are made by your entire team, IEP or 504. And again, they're recorded in those sections that we talked about. So oral presentation, the very first one that you see here, a lot of times that refers to, especially when it's a reading assessment, um, that we're able to read and reread directions, prompts for um, writing assessments, um, test items, which are typically like the questions and answer choices. If it is a math assessment, typically those um, math questions, if a student has oral presentation as well as the answer choices, um, but an actual passage for like, let's say a reading or writing assessment, unless they're approved for a unique accommodation, we aren't typically able to actually read the passages because again, we're assessing their ability to read and comprehend. So that's where those allowable testing accommodations come in where we're really looking at what are we trying to assess and would this accommodation give students an additional leg up um, or support that would hinder us being able to determine what they are actually capable of on their own. Um, the next one is verbal encouragement. And a lot of people laugh when I say this, but typically during um, many of our standardized assessments, a script is provided and um, test administrators are not to veer from that script, even while walking around and monitoring and circulating. So for some students that we know need additional an additional push or even motivation or just encouragement throughout the assessment, they do have that accommodation on there where a teacher may be able to um, provide them a little more of that um, during an assessment than they would if they did not have that accommodation listed. Enter answers directly in the test book. So for some of the assessments, there's an actual test book and then there's an answer sheet. And so for our students that have difficulty transferring, it may be best if they actually answer or circle or bubble in right there in the test book, as opposed to going over and trying to transfer the answers. A lot of our kids end up mixing up um, numbers and which letter goes where, which would totally throw the results. So there are um, some assessments that are set up that way. So that accommodation is another one that we see often for situations um, where they are set up um, in that manner. Frequent breaks, if it is necessary, again, um, that would be something that would be documented in the IEP where a student needs to take multiple breaks throughout the assessment. Many of the standardized assessments do come with time limitations. And so if a student needs or requires to take breaks throughout that time, that's something that would have to be listed and shared as a testing accommodation so that um, the test administrator, again, the parent, the student understands they can take those breaks and then revisit and come back to the assessment. Um, preferential seating, um, just again, depending on the student, and that might be that they need to sit at the very front. It might mean that they need to sit away from the group. Preferential seating, again, could mean various things. It just means that we actually stop and we're strategic in regards to where that student sits based on their individual needs. Um, extended time. And so for this one, 
it is not synonymous with just the entirety of the school day. And I think there's a major misconception with that. Um, it's not unlimited time unless it is specified. So there are IEPs that say the full extent of the school day. And then there are others that may say double the amount of allotted time or time and a half. Again, that's determined based on student needs. So if we find that a student needs an entire school day because based on what we've seen in the classroom or based on um, the student's disability that is warranted, a student will be provided with what we consider unlimited time. However, if we find, and again, it's all data-based, it's based on what's being seen in the classroom, a student that typically needs about double the time for an assessment, then it'll be specified in the IEP that it is double the amount of allotted time. And again, that's going to look different because different tests have different allotments of time um, for completion for students. Um, I will also mention there um, with extended time, most assessments, if not all, will also mention that they are to finish within the day that they began the test. And so as a test, previous testing coordinator, I'd always get questions about, can the student take half today and half tomorrow? You know, it's a lot for them. Typically, no. Once they begin the assessment, they have the extended time throughout the extent of that particular school day, but it's not to be carried over to others unless it is a, an assessment that has multiple sessions. But even then, they must finish the session that they are working in um, within the school day that they have started it. The next one is testing in a familiar place with a familiar test proctor. And so for some of our students, they are fine with testing with whomever. Um, a lot of times we work with different testing groups or our schedules are adjusted for testing. And so they may be in a different classroom, especially those that are in secondary, middle school and high school. Um, but for some of our kiddos, it really does matter um, if they're with the same teacher. I, my little one, I'm always transparent of how um, he does have a disability as well. And it is really important that he tests or he works with someone that he's familiar with. It brings down the anxiety. He's able to focus on then just the test. And it's sort of the same thing with um, the testing environment for him. So sometimes they have to get really strategic with scheduling testing for students with this accommodation to make sure that they can test with someone they're familiar with and they are also in a familiar location. Um, stimuli reduced. So again, removing some things. Um, it could possibly be things from their desk or the actual room. Um, just again, if there are difficulties with focus, that um, particular accommodation tends to help with that. Adaptive or special furniture. Again, that would be something where we wouldn't just arrange that for testing. That would be something that a student has all throughout that we are also then providing them for um, the assessment. And then assistive technology. If your student has or uses assistive technology that is allowable for testing or on that assessment, they will also be allowed to use it for the assessment. Now, I will caution you just depending on the um, AT device or um, items, some of those are not allowable. So depending on the function, what's being assessed, um, that is something that will also be specified in a child's IEP if there's um, assistive technology that they are not able to use on an assessment or the, the function has to be modified in order to make it an allowable um, accommodation for the student. So, Taranisha, before we move on, because this mm -hmm. really did generate a lot in the chat, and mm -hmm. I know that people have been really appreciative about you being so responsive and so knowledgeable. So, one of the parents was saying that a teacher stated that um, her child did not finish a test and can no longer take the test. What would be a situation in which that would um, have occurred? Say that, can you repeat the question? I missed sure. the first piece. It's okay. The teacher told her that her child did not finish a test and can no longer take the test. Was this test, was it a statewide assessment or is this something for this current school year? Um, let me scroll down a little bit and it says, um, she said that she wanted to get help because this was a graded test. And they are not communicating. So it sounds, Jasmine, if, if you don't mind dropping in the chat, um, 
it sounds as though this was uh, more of a classroom situation and not like a standardized state test. Okay, and I'll answer for both because typically with our standardized or state um, assessments, again, once we hit the end of the school day, the students cannot return to that assessment. So if it were any sort of standardized assessment, once they've started, and that's where I kind of hit with the extended time, the students cannot return. We've had, we have had those situations where students have started at the start of the school day, went all the way till the end, they did not finish, and we are not, based on standardized instructions and allowable accommodations, we are not allowed to have them revisit or finish that assessment. Um, as far as our classroom assessments, Again, depending on what the assessment's being used for, because again, it, it kind of threatens the test security and the validity of the students leave and then they come back to revisit the assessment. Now, in most cases, I will tell you, again, if it's just a general typical classroom assessment, especially if the student did not have their full amount of time during that school day, um, most of the time they are able to come back and revisit. But again, depending on what that data is used for, the type of assessment, sometimes that is the protocol. If the student has left because now they are open to all sorts of resources that could then support them prior to returning to that assessment. So it does kind of threaten the secure, test security and validity. So I would need to know more about which particular assessment and what the assessment data was being used for because that does matter in mm -hmm. regards to why yes. that may or may not occur. Right. She said it was a classroom test, but it also sounds like in this situation, you know, being able to reach out to the school, to the testing coordinator, to the teacher, even if you were to ask for a conference, just to have better clarity about um, the parameters and expectations. And then as a parent, you get a chance to also say, but this is what my child truly needs in order to be successful. And don't you think that would be helpful? Absolutely. And that's why I say I, when we get very specific, because again, I can speak from a general realm, um, your school is your best bet. And again, I'd, pro I'd bring in all your staffing specialist, the classroom based teacher, as well as the testing coordinator. We've had situations where like routinely a student was giving a classroom based assessment and maybe they only had double time. And that was the, the school's way of then documenting that, okay, double time's not enough. We may need to increase that time because consistently the student is working diligently, but they're not getting through the assessment. So I would definitely thank you, um, Victoria, for reminding us to do that. I would definitely have that conversation with the school because it may be a situation where the student needs more allowable accommodation time that would then also transfer over to standardized assessments. Um, but it will also give you clarity as a parent in regards to what those guidelines and procedures look like for specific assessments that are on their campus. Awesome. And there was another question. A parent is saying that asking, are there accommodations for students that have not acquired writing independently like their peers, meaning they can write, but they require like sentence starters or reminders regarding sentence structure? Her child in particular has very limited um, uh, speech and has an accommodation for time to verbally answer questions in a regular classroom instruction. Depending on the assessment, and so I was going to mention that there are accommodations where a student can verbally respond and then someone can transcribe. But again, it depends on what the assessment is assessing. We do have writing assessments um, sometimes that may or may not um, allow those things. It really depends on what's being assessed and what they're trying to determine mastery of. Um, but it sounds like if your little one already has the accommodation where they can verbally or orally respond, and then someone else is able to transcribe, there are even standardized assessments that allow those accommodations um, to take place. As far as sentence starters, um, and support with the writing. Again, it depends on the assessment and again, what they are actually trying to assess. So that would be another one that I would definitely reach out to the school-based um, testing coordinator just to determine what which assessments your student takes 
and then they can look at specifically um, what that would look like for those accommodations. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much. I, it's been very helpful as we've gone along. I think I can certainly say that the parents have been very engaged and um, and they really want to be able to have the information. So thank you so much. Absolutely. So although the windows for standardized assessments are important, students take classroom-based assessments on an ongoing basis throughout the school year. It's important for teachers, parents, and students, when appropriate, to know and understand the accommodations that they are entitled to for all assessments and classroom activities. And I think another parent brought this up. Um, just depending on the student's age, I would encourage you also to use those sections within the IEP to empower your student to speak up and remind teachers or even within themselves, think about the accommodations that they have and how they're there to help them. Again, my own student is in third grade and it's something that we're starting to have more conversations about. I'm reminding him for classroom assessments that, hey, we have a reading assessment today. Make sure that you know you're asking for those questions to be read aloud to you. A lot of times he doesn't have to ask, they'll ask, you know, they'll read those questions to him. But I remind him, these things are here to help you. He oftentimes tells me that he can read and I just remind him that that's okay, you absolutely can read. But as a team, we've decided that that accommodation is there to support you in your comprehension and understanding what's being asked. So it is very empowering um, when appropriate. And again, that's a family-based um, decision for you all. For me, I felt that it was the appropriate time for my son, but to also ensure that they're aware of their accommodations in the classroom, on assessments, um, and again, also on those major and statewide assessments. I hope this presentation has been informative for you all. If you still have questions or concerns related to um, your student and the assessments or accommodations that they'll have this school year, please, please, please feel free to submit a parent support ticket. Um, those right now are all coming to me, so I'll be on the other side of those. Um, you may also use the ticketing system to ask general questions. Um, you can request resources or just get general help um, and support for you or your child. Um, again, if you have things that are very specific, I can even help you reach out to the school or collaborate with um, each party so that we ensure that you have the information to best support um, your student with assessment accommodations, classroom-based accommodations, and really any other ESC matters um, that you may have. So Taranisha, you know, whenever I unmute and show up on camera, we've got we've got some questions in the chat. No so, problem. So um, they weren't exactly related to the accommodations. So I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss them. We do have a parent saying, if you feel that, um, you need a school that truly understands how to serve a child with an IEP and you feel that your current school isn't doing that, what advice would you have for that parent? For now, I would say to submit a parent support ticket, I'd like to hear more specifics in regards to what the parent may feel is not necessarily being addressed at the current school. And so we could have some conversations in regards to student needs, as well as um, what it could look like in regards to advocating or getting some of those supports at the current school. So I would say um, just for the sake of this platform, um, a parent support ticket would be best. Um, you can even reference that you are an attendee in this particular um, um, workshop or mini academy, and I'll know. Um, but no, definitely submit a parent support ticket. We can talk through some different school choice options if that's the route you'd prefer to go, but I'd really like to um, support you in, you know, working to kind of advocate and determine the needs and how they can be addressed at the current school if you choose to go that route as well. That's wonderful. And then I also have a parent asking if they're able to move the IEP meeting date to the beginning of each year, they were always told that it has to be around the child's birthday. <laughs> If the initial meeting um, for eligibility was around the child's birthday, those meetings are typically annual and so they're a year out. 
So as far as an annual meeting, it's not necessarily the student's birthday. It's, you know, whenever that first meeting was initiated, you can ask for a team meeting at any given point um, in between. But as far as just the routine or annual meeting, that does happen, you know, after a full year. And again, if it just so happens to be around the student's birthday, then it would occur each year near the student's birthday. But again, you are able to request a meeting um, with the team at any given point if you have concerns or things that you feel that needs to be addressed prior to. So if right now you feel that um, the IEP may need to be adjusted or we need to look at specific accommodations or possibly even address um, some things that have changed, you can request that the, the team meets and convenes and you guys can have those conversations again as a team um, at any given point. So you do have the right to request a meeting prior to that annual review. Okay, that was really helpful. I, I think also because sometimes, you know, parents think that the the date on the paperwork is almost like it's written in stone. But I think parents do need to know that any time you have a concern or any time you want to be able to come back to the table to readdress yes. something, they have the right to request that, right? Absolutely. Anytime you have concerns, you are able to request um, for the, the team to convene to discuss any of those concerns. Um, if you have questions, again, if there are changes that you're seeing, um, a lot of times it is apparent that will reach out and say, hey, I think we need to get together to address some things. So no, you do not have to wait that full year. If there aren't concerns um, on the school-based side, um, that is the routine answer that yes, you know, the annual review is yearly or annually, but anytime in between those, those meetings, you are able to request um, a team meeting. Um, and then there's also a question asking if there's a new parent liaison because the one listed on the website is no longer with OCPS. As of right now, there is not. So any questions, concerns, parent related, those are coming to me and my contact information will be placed um, back on the screen shortly. Um, we are looking for another, so we are working on that, but as of right now, um, we no longer have our prior parent liaison, and in the meantime, I handle all things parent outreach, parent concerns, and questions. Um, thank you. I know Taranisha is amazing, so um, it, I'm looking at the chat, and parents are acknowledging you are knowledgeable, you are very helpful. Thank you. One parent said they learned more in an hour than they did reading all the brochures. Oh, that is awesome, and no, please, I, I'm telling please feel free to use the ticket. Um, I laugh because I say I've, I've earned a few best friends through the ticket, who, you know, just routinely reach out now. Um, again, I always transparently share, I, before, you know, I put on my work hat, I am the parent of a student with disability. So I am totally there, I get it. There's times I wake up in the middle of the night with a question, and so I totally get it, I understand. Um, please feel free to use that ticket and I will do my best to either give you answers myself or connect you with the right people within our department that can support you. And like I said, that's everything from resources to helping you um, advocate and kind of navigate with um, your school site. I work with all of the schools and staffing specialists just to ensure that all of our students are getting exactly what they need. And I thank you, Tarnisha, you do. You are incredibly responsive and you're you. such a I'm servant trying. to our families. You really are. Um, a parent was also asking what kind of exceptionality would qualify for a good cause exemption if a student does not score a two or higher on state assessments. My understanding is that it's not a specific exceptionality that is going to qualify for good cause. Can you explain that a little better? Yes, so it is not a specific exceptionality. Um, and so I won't speak to the good cause exemptions for this specific school year, because again, we do get guidance for those annually, but I will tell you over the last few years, it is not a specific exceptionality, more so prior retentions if the student is an ESD student. So again, the guidelines change from year to year, but in my experience, it's never been a specific exceptionality. It's more so that they fall under the ESD umbrella and they've already had a prior 
retention that could possibly um, provide them with the good cause exemption. There are other um, good cause exemptions as well that an ESC student very well could you know, fall under or qualify for as well. But as far as ESC specific, it is not specific to um, an exceptionality. Uh, also, um, it, it, another compliment, this was a very robust presentation. And then a question, do Thank teachers you. get this information as well if they have misconceptions? And it's my understanding that as part of the ongoing continuing ed and recertification requirements for teachers, they are required to take ESE um, professional development. And so a lot of this information would be included in that. Is that correct? Absolutely. And annually, all teachers that administer any of the assessments that we've referenced here or that you will find in those manuals, they also have to go through um, an assessment training, like a test administ a test administrator training. I can't talk. I'm sorry. And they typically go over the accommodations there if they school has a teacher that's working with a specific group that has accommodations, those are also shared then. So there's training annually. And um, as Victoria just shared with you, um, it is a requirement in order to recertify that they go through um, courses specific to special education um, and accommodations um, in order to recertify every so many years. And then we have another um, question asking, does OCPS or is OCPS able to provide an advocate for their child or is that something that is, is a parent responsibility? So OCPS does not provide advocates. Um, that would be a parent responsibility. Um, my position, I would say, is probably the closest thing to it where you are able to reach out. Um, I can go over IEPs with families. I can kind of look through those things. You can ask me questions. Um, I can assist parents with working with the school. Um, but again, my role, I am not an advocate. It's more so just helping parents understand some of the technicalities that come along with special education. Um, again, I do reach out to schools sometimes on parents' behalf if, you know, they're not sure of how to ask certain questions, um, but we do not provide advocates um, within the district for families. That would be something that a parent would have to um, do on their own. And that makes sense. Um, absolutely does. Um, I also have a parent saying that the classroom that um, her son is in is very limited in supplies for sensory needs. As parents, are we able to donate supplies for that purpose for the use of all the children in the classroom, not just their child? To my knowledge, again, it depends on what those items are. I would work with your specific school, the staffing specialist and administration. I'm not sure if the needs there have been shared with administration, but that is something that if it hasn't already been taken um, to that level and those needs are outlined for those students that I would make sure administration is aware of. Again, depending on what the items are, there are some things that, again, even within the district are allowable and that are not allowable. So I would work with the school-based team um, just to determine, you know, what you're able to donate versus not. But I would also ensure that um, the school-based administrators are aware um, of those needs if there are things that are lacking. I would totally agree. I do know that many times, um, uh, having been a site-based administrator, you know, you aren't necessarily aware that uh, there is a greater need for more resources until it's brought to your attention. And I do know that uh, almost every administrator I know wants to make sure that every child at school has exactly what they need in order to succeed. That's why we. We show up every day. It's because of the kids. So definitely reach out to the school and let them know because they may not be aware. Um, also, we have a question that from a parent that says, if the school doesn't think your student needs more accommodations during an assessment, who can they ask to revisit that? Again, so there are people at the district level and Again, all accommodations are data based. So I would suggest if that were the case where, you know, they were sharing that, you know, the student doesn't necessarily need more assessment accommodations to ask for that data. Um, because again, there should be data to support 
what a student needs, why we're making the decisions that we're making. So you can request that data, or if it's something where this is a new change, again, as our students grow, sometimes um, disabilities manifest in different ways. It may look different from year to year, so it may be something where they need to begin taking additional data to say that, you know, that need has changed slightly. So I would have that conversation in regards to the data to support um, the decision making. Um, again, if necessary, feel free to submit a ticket um, and we can look at the district personnel that's um, assigned to that school to also support you in the school and ensuring that, you know, we're collecting the appropriate data to make sure that we're also providing the student with the appropriate amount of time um, that they need for the assessments and instructional tasks that they're being provided. Well, and you get many, many thanks from parents. They're very grateful for you. Um, I do that. know that we're coming to an end of our yes, time. So before we do, I want to give a plug because we have the big IDEA ESE conference coming up. Yes. Do you want to share with parents before they leave a little bit about our big idea conference and what it could mean for them? Absolutely. So annually we have a conference that is specific to ESE parents such as yourselves. Um, we have internal, which are some of our OCPS teams, as well as some of our partner agencies that will be coming in to um, do workshops for families. Um, this year's um, Big Idea Conference, there will be three different sessions that you're able, or I'm saying this all wrong. You were able to select three different sessions to attend during the full day or half day conference. Um, again, with topics ranging from transition to preschool support, um, compliance things with IDEA. So it's a plethora of information. Um, I, even myself, always learn a lot just from the presenters that we bring in in regards to special education, um, sometimes bills and mandates that have changed. Um, so we absolutely invite you out on October 14th. It is virtual. Um, so just look out for information regarding that. We will have some things sent out specifically to our families so that you're able to register and attend. But again, we have some awesome external agencies coming in to present for us and lots of our internal teams that will also be there to connect with you, um, share their information in regards to supports within the district and also useful information um, that will support you in supporting your student throughout the school year. Well, we're excited. We always partner with Taranisha for that virtual Parent Academy. It is October 14th. It's a Saturday. It is from nine to 12. We do it virtually because we understand how challenging finding childcare can be, and this tends to help parents. I also want to make sure that you see that we dropped in the link, um, the um, link to be able to see some of the other Parent Academies we offer. We have a lot. Uh, we average two virtual mini academies uh, from six to seven in the evening almost every week. We do have face-to-face. -face. We have a college and career fair coming up the week after the Big Idea Conference, which will be at Freedom High School, and that's October 21st. And then again, we will be um, having a wonderful parent academy in February called Championing Your Child, Knowing What They Need and How to Get It. So for a lot of ESE parents, this is also another opportunity to get more parent workshops and to be able to get more resources. If you did not see in the chat, and I will drop it again, this is going to be available. A recording of tonight's session is available uh, on our YouTube, uh, our family OCPS Families YouTube channel. So I'm going to say that one more time. It's the OCPS Families YouTube channel. And within 48 hours, we will post the recording so that if you did miss it, if you came in late, you would be able to see it. I also noticed that in the comments, some of the parents had mentioned that they didn't see the text reminder until about 30 minutes before. I always listen to that feedback, and so we can definitely adjust that time frame to make sure that you have more notice and that you would be more aware because the goal is to reach as many parents as possible. Absolutely. I want to again thank you, Taranisha, for being with us. It is always a pleasure, and it's always a learning experience. Thank you. 
And I also want to thank all of the OCPS families that joined us this evening. We look forward to having you back at another Virtual Parent Academy. Have a good night and take care. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.